morning, everyone. Um, welcome to Grand Rounds this morning. This is Amy Cagle. Um, I wanted to introduce two of our pediatric speech pathologists. It's my pleasure to introduce both Samantha Litt and Kristen Winslow to you today. Um, Kristen Winslow completed both her undergraduate and her graduate education at the University of North Carolina, uh, where she earned her Master's of Science degree in Speech Language Pathology. Kristen completed her clinical fellowship year at Badford Associates in North Carolina. Kristen's been practicing pediatric speech pathology for 30 years. Uh, the last 16 years, she's been at Carilion Children's, working in the inpatient and outpatient and early intervention settings. Kristen has an immense passion for serving medically complex children and their families. In 2018, Kristen completed training to become a board-certified neonatal therapist. Samantha Litt obtained her undergraduate degree in communication sciences and disorders from Radford University in 2006 and her Master's of Science degree in Speech-Language Pathology in 2008 from Radford University. Samantha Litz completed her clinical fellowship year at Carilion Clinic. She's been practicing for 13 years, which have all been here at Carilion. In the past 10 to 11 years, she's been serving medically complex children, addressing feeding and swallowing issues both in the inpatient and in the outpatient setting. Kristen participates in multidisciplinary teams, including the feeding clinic and our air digestive clinic. She's in the process of pursuing her board certification in swallowing and swallowing disorders. So welcome, Kristen and Sam. Thank you, Amy, for that introduction. Good morning, everybody. Um, Kristen and I would just like to thank you guys for letting us um, come talk to you today about and so on fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing. <clears throat> we have no disclosures. So after our presentation this morning, we hope that you will be able to determine appropriate candidates for referrals for fees, identify the advantages of fees versus a modified dream swallow study, and understand the basic fees procedure in both the outpatient and inpatient settings. So let's start with the definition of FEES. FEES stands for Fiber Optic Endoscopic Evaluation of Swallowing. And if you can say that 10 times fast, without getting tongue-tied, I'll give you a sticker. Um, <laughs> but that's why we call it FEES, because that's kind of a, a tongue twister. Um, but what it is, it's the transnasal passage of the flexible endoscope to be the pharyngeal and laryngeal structures. And it provides an assessment of the movement and sensation of those structures the patient's ability to protect their airway during swallowing and the response to therapeutic modifications. So who might be a candidate for fees? Um, patients who present with clinical signs of aspiration, aspiration during a bedside evaluation. Um, patients who, serve, or who are MPO, we can use this as an assessment to evaluate the safety for introduction of oral feedings. Patients with known or suspected laryngeal abnormalities, patients with an abnormal swallow study finding that need further or repeat assessment, <clears throat> surgical patients, including pre-op assessment for risk of aspiration, post-op, those would include patients who have had like a supraglottoplasty um, or potentially a tracheostomy, and then patients with difficulty managing their secretions. First, let's talk about the two types of instrumental swallowing assessments that we typically use, and those would be the modified barium swallow study, um, which is under fluoroscopy in the uh, fluoro suite, either inpatient or outpatient. Um, both of these instrumental studies have their advantages and disadvantages, so we're going to go through both um, as we go to compare. So let's start with swallow studies. So MBSS stands for Modified Barium Swallow Study. Um, this allows for a view of all of the phases of swallowing. So as the patient takes a drink or a bite, we can assess what's going on inside the mouth as they go to trigger the swallow in the pharyngeal, in the laryngeal, and in the esophageal phase. So we can see all the way down potentially to the stomach if needed. There's no discomfort for this study. The patient just sits in our special little chair, which I like to call the throne, um, and they just sit there and eat pretty much. It can be a little scary because you're a little enclosed, but that's all you have to do. So there's no discomfort. 
we can see um, what our compensatory strategies will accomplish um, during this study, and we can provide um, a view of ongoing swallows. So, for instance, when a baby is eating, they have rapid consecutive swallows, and we're able to see that on um, flora. We can also assess um, the esophageal phase, so below the um, level of the upper esophageal sphincter. We can look down to see what's happening. Is there a delay? Is there backflow? And there's no whiteout period, which we'll talk about when we talk about fees, what the whiteout period is. Um, we can view how deep the penetration is, if there is any, and see if that's correlated to or predictive of aspiration. So what are some of the disadvantages? First of all, the big one is radiation exposure. Um, then we have to add barium, either liquid or paste to the foods that we offer the patient. So barium is a white liquid or paste. It's very chalky. And I would say the paste kind of has a vanilla flavor and the liquid has more of an apple flavor. So you can probably imagine, our babies love it. They love the taste of liquid barium. <laughs> For what reason, I'm not sure. Um, but if you have a two-year-old who's decided that they are going to own their meals, um, you can imagine adding an apple flavor to their milk might not taste very good, or adding a vanilla flavor to a sausage biscuit <laughs> might not taste very good. Um, and we have to be really creative with how we present these foods because if you add white, and this is bright white liquid or paste, to um, a toddler's food, they're going to know and probably refuse right away. So. Um, that can result in refusal overall. So um, also these patients have to be able to eat and drink in order to participate. There has to be at least a minimal oral intake. So things have had to have been tried. If you have a patient that's been MPO and is orally averse, then a swallow study is going to be very, very challenging. Um, our patients that have motor impairments that might do best positioned in a medical wheelchair or a medical stroller, those are a little bit tricky too because the space between the arm of the flora machine and the table is pretty narrow. So if you have a patient with a larger wheelchair that they use for eating, it might be tricky to get them in. Sometimes we've had to MacGyver the arms off, but we try to do our best. This also requires transportation to the radiology suite. So if your patient is in the hospital, they have to transport them through the hospital, which also takes coordination of who's what staff is going to be available to transport them. Um, and then we also run into potential viscosity changes when you add barium. So for example, if you have a patient who is receiving 27 calorie um, formula, that viscosity of the formula might be thicker at baseline. Well, we tend to add barium to that to get the good contrast, which thins that formula from the get-go. Let's talk more about this radiation exposure. So the National Cancer Institute said that children are considerably more sensitive to radiation than adults. Um, they have a longer life expectancy than adults, so their window of opportunity, um, they have a larger window of opportunity for expressing the radiation damage. Um, and they may receive a higher dose of radiation than is necessary. So when we do modified barium swallow studies, we make sure that we do not over magnify our view because that will um, create a larger exposure of radiation dose. Um, so we're very careful with that. We also limit the time that we're um, turning on the fluoroscopy. Um, in this study in 2018 called Estimating Thyroid Doses and Modified Swallow Studies, they talked about how the thyroid gland is the only radiation organ to carcinogenesis that is fully exposed during radiation of the swallow study. So typically, we um, shield the patients covering their laps if they'll tolerate that, and they have a shield on their side, but you can't shield their neck because that's what we're looking at. In this study, um, which is from 2020, capturing infant swallowing impairments and video fluoroscopy timing matters, they looked at 30 infants assessed under fluoroscopy at timed intervals. So they um, had patients of postmenstrual age of 49 weeks. What they were able to see was that the average bolus size was only 0.2 mLs, and their feeding of four ounces took 600 swallows to complete. 
So if we look at different time intervals in fluoro, what we're doing is we're turning the fluoro on and off periodically to assess the swallow as we go versus leaving it on consecutively. So at 30 seconds, the patient had had 20 swallows, which is only 3% of the feeding. And at one minute, they had 40 swallows, which is only 7% of the feeding. We try to keep our studies under two minutes. So you can imagine the limit, the limited view of swallows that you're going to see in two minutes um, with that. So potentially only 14% of the feeding. This study, radiation exposure from BFSS in children with type 1 laryngeal cleft and pharyngeal dysphagia, a retrospective study looked at 78 children over five years who had laryngeal clefts in their management. So the mean number of swallow studies that they received was 3.24. The average dose of radiation was 0.16 millisieverts, um, millisieverts is just a measurement of radiation. So they compared this to chest x-rays. So one chest x-ray is 0.017 millisieverts, and that concluded that children received an average of 30 chest x-rays over their management, meaning that they got approximately 10 chest x-rays for one swallow study. <clears throat> so by doing these here at Carillion Children, we're trying to reduce the amount of radiation that these children are exposed to. A lot of our kids that we see are typically com medically complex and require multiple studies across their, their lifetime. So here's a chart looking at um, our fees per month. Um, we began doing them pretty consistently in 2019, so that's the blue one. Um, and then last year we were able to utilize fees more frequently because of the an inpatient, an inpatient setting, we didn't have to transport the patient through the hospital. So more, pa more providers were willing to do this study rather than do a swallow study because they didn't have to go through the hospital in the middle of a pandemic. Um, so you can see in March and April we didn't do any because we were trying to figure out what this new normal was going to look like, but we did spike up after that. This chart looks at both inpatient and outpatient. Over the course of those years since 2019, you can see we provided significantly more in 2020, and our trajectory as of this year, we will likely surpass what we did last year. Um, and most of the patients that received fees that we kind of categorized in these groups would be patients that primarily only received fees. Um, so they didn't. The majority of them did not have to have a swallow study in addition to, or if they did, it was minimal. So let's talk about the advantages. Um, so this study provides a clear view of the structures um, to assess the functional ability of the airway. It's less expensive and it's more portable, like I mentioned. We can complete it at the bedside, either while we're an inpatient in the NICU, PEDS, and PICU. Um, there's no time limit and there's no radiation exposure. So Kristen and I are able to watch from beginning to end of a full feeding. Um, as long as the patient is tolerating it, then we keep going. We don't have to add any barium to the food or liquid, um, so it doesn't alter the taste. Uh, we can examine the nasal and pharyngeal mucosa, which can sometimes show us signs of reflux. Um, and we can assess the symmetry of the pharyngeal structures. We have the ability to evaluate the readiness for oral feeding. So if a patient isn't, is not MPO and we want to start, if they're only taking small volumes or if they're having trouble managing their secretions, we're able to assess all of that. Uh, we can repeat this more frequently than the swallow study. So previously, we would, if a patient was in the hospital, we might do a swallow study. If we needed to repeat it, we would wait at least a week. Um, with our fees, we've done them as frequently as every other day. And we're also able to assess infants while breastfeeding, which is something that you can't do. There are some disadvantages. There's a little pressure and discomfort when you pass the scope through the nose. That subsides once you get in position. Um, we've done this to each other many times, so I can vouch for that. So it's not painful, but it does feel funny. Um, sometimes it can cause gagging or vomiting, especially if the patient's a little wiggly. Sometimes they might 
they might gag. We haven't had any vomiting, thank goodness. Um, but when I was talking about the whiteout period before, so when we have the scope in place and the patient swallows, their soft palate closes against the tip of the scope, which causes what we call the whiteout period. So it goes white for a second, and then once everything opens up, we're able to view. So the cords do disappear during the actual swallow. Um, the inability to view the oral and the pharyngeal phases, I mean, I'm sorry, esophageal phases. So we can't see what's going on in the mouth and we can't see what's going on below um, the PE junction. And then it does require specialized comprehensive training for the people performing the study. All right. Like Samantha said, we um, have really built this program both in our inpatient and our outpatient settings. They look similar um, in many ways in both settings. Um, for our inpatient unit um, or units, because we do perform these in the NICU, in our PICU, and on our uh, PEEP floor. So one of us will pass the scope, and one of us will hold and feed um, the patient. We do add green food coloring to the liquid or baby food. Um, this just allows us to be able to see and differentiate um, between secretions and you know where the food is actually going. Um, and this, uh, it, we do use McCormick, and that has been approved by our NICU pharmacist. <clears throat> We do prefer that the bedside nurse um, stays with us um, just to monitor vitals, you know, make sure, you know, our patient stays stable throughout the study. Um, we do welcome our parents to be present um, and observe. We've had a couple that <laughs> they thought that they could, you know, watch the whole thing, and I think we've had a couple of dads have to have to step away. So it is a very different, you know, um, kind of experience for these patients. Um, we do review the study together afterwards and kind of come up with, you know, our, our feeding plan going forward. And any time we um, sense that there could be something not quite right with the structures, we review these with our ENT. Um, we do oftentimes, we may know ahead of time. Um, that we're suspecting something going on uh, structurally with the larynx, and we'll just have our ENT present with us for the study. Um, the order numbers, uh, in case you want to jot this down on how to order a feed, um, it's SLP 29, um, and then the consult itself, which is separate from fees, is SLP 1. So in our outpatient setting, um, these are done in our ENT department, which is at Riverside, soon to be Tanglewood. Um, again, both of us are present for the study. <clears throat> um, one big difference um, in our outpatient setting, so our parents are bringing their children to us. So we do have them kind of participate with us, and they may hand us a bottle, they may hand us or you know, offer the passy or a spoon. Um, so they're kind of a um, you know, more participatory in our outpatient uh, studies. And again, um, we do have the green food coloring, and we review those studies right after we're done. And the order numbers are the same. So we do have um, <clears throat> special training that we have to go through. Um, ASHA, which is our sort of governing body recognizes that speech language pathologists are able to perform these studies. And if you want to go and read that policy, there's the link. Um, it's quite long. So we have, so ASHA, our governing body, has, you know, specifications to, you know, what requirements you need to go through to be able to perform these. The state has requirements. We won't go through all of those. But Carillion has also, um, thanks to Amy, um, has, has developed competencies for being able to perform these studies. It's not, here's the scope, good luck, you know, go for it. So these are just a few of the big things that we had to, um, to do, and we're very thankful that Dr. Cable um, kind of was our 
primary mentor through our training process. So <clears throat> we had to perform endoscopy on a minimum of 10 normal subjects. Sam and I were <laughs> a lot of those normal subjects um, under the direct supervision of a trained mentor. We completed five case studies of the fees procedures and we observed and assisted a trained clinician in a minimum of five fees procedures. <clears throat> and then we did a minimum of 15 patients under direct supervision of a trained ENT or qualified mentor. This is our equipment for fees. <clears throat> On the left, um, it's really the, uh, that's our mobile transportable unit that we take into um, our inpatient room. We have given her the name of Fancy um, because she does a lot of cool things. Um, and if you see us pushing, if you see me pushing, well, you probably can't see me pushing this because I'm shorter than the tower. <laughs> and then on the right is the flexible stick itself. So this is just a comparison of the images for both the modified swallow study and C. So on the left, this is an infant bottle feeding. And you can see the contrast here. So the bolus is splitting. So this is the level of the um, PE junction is what we call it. So this little one is getting into trouble. We would call this penetration. And this bolus is headed in the right direction. This one's not. And that's the view on the right. That's what we are able to see the feet. That is not an infant. <laughs> that's, a, that's a bigger person because the structures are a little more um, defined. And this is just um, kind of a snapshot of what um, what things look like for us. So at the top left is our setup for um, both inpatient and outpatient. So um, I'm not sure if you can see, but we've got three different bottles there with three different flow rates, and each one is labeled. So <laughs> when we're in the process of doing our study, um, we need to make a change with a faster or slower flow nipple the feeder can just grab and go. We do not want to um, go in and out with the scope. Um, we try to, to keep the scope in there no matter the position, the position change, uh, bottle change, anything like that. Down here, um, Samantha is scoping. I'm feeding the baby in kind of an elevated sideline position. And top right, you can see um, can't really see the, the view of um, the image that Sam was looking for. And then we had to include our adjustable chair. Her name is Sally. <laughs> All right, so some of the landmarks. So the vocal folds there, they kind of um, are in the shape of a V. And if you've intubated, this is kind of an upside down view for you all. Um, <clears throat> so these are the vocal cords kind of look like rubber bands. Epiglottis. The arytenoids. The esophageal opening, which is closed at baseline um, and relaxes to open when the uh, bolus passes. The area epiglottic folds, which is kind of that connective tissue um, from the arytenoids to the epiglottis the piriform sinuses. All right, so now we're gonna move to actually showing you um, several different uh, studies that we've completed. Um, the first one is normal. It's kind of the closest and best normal that we could find. Um, the fact that we're doing a fees kind of clinically, we're suspecting something's going on in the first place, so um, it's very rare that we actually see normal. <clears throat> so this study is um, with a five month old. She had multiple admissions, um, failure to thrive, vomiting, like just lots of motility issues. But with each admission, um, we sort of figured out that things were more complicated by social issues versus something that was kind of idiopathic in nature. So uh, we're gonna watch this. I will say she is breathing a little fast, but she protects her airway. 
You can see the epiglottis. You can see the vocal cords. <coughs> there went a bolus. So this kind of gives you an idea of what that whiteout period looks like. normal. Any questions with that one? All right, so this is reflux. <clears throat> so this little guy at the time of the study was 38 weeks. Um, his history was significant for 30-week gestation. Um, high drops. He has a grade 1. BH on the right, <coughs> excuse me, a grade two on the left with paraventricular leukomalacia. He was on 24 calorie uh, less milk fortified with Insacare, which is very common in our DNA population. Um, <coughs> his clinical presentation, um, he became very uncoordinated very easily. Um, lots of breath holding, um, dropping his uh, oxygen saturations to the low 80s. And you could hear kind of nasal pharyngeal penetration. So you could hear the formula kind of going up into his nose. He did better in an upright position versus a sideline position, which is a position we frequently use in the NICU. Um, <clears throat> so he would get to about half of his volume, and then he would just stop. So this is what reflux looks like. Right away, you can, here it comes. Here it comes. <laughs> Penetration, so it went to the level of the cords. And right here, it's just sitting there. He's breathing, breathing, airway is wide open. So Sam and I are holding out breath, like, just waiting for him to aspirate. So you can just see it right there. So what we um, recommended for him uh, was a change in the fortification. Um, so we had a trial of fortifying mom's breast milk with Simper Spit Up, and within two days, he was a completely different, completely different kid. I mean, we were talking about a G tube, you know, with this kiddo. So that's how significant his reflux um, was in impacting his feeding. All right, here's our favorite. Whoops. So this is aspiration. <clears throat> and I will warn you, there is a lot going on in this video. <laughs> it is very busy. Um, but here's the kind of the backstory with this patient. Um, she was three months old at the time of the study. She was born at 34 weeks. She's a twin. Um, and she was discharged from our NICU at 37 weeks. Um, she had three readmissions after discharge. Um, the first one was for a pyloric stenosis repair. The second and third emissions, <clears throat> she presented with poor feeding, lethargy. She was acidotic. There was some seizure activity. And she required intubation um, with both of those admissions. Um, the second admission, um, she had a chest X-ray that was conclusive for aspiration pneumonia. Her third admission, which was very shortly after her second admission, um, there was recommendations for a modified barium swallow study. So we actually did perform that study first. Um, so during that study, she demonstrated um, epiglottic undercoating, penetration of the bolus to the level of the cords, um, with eventual aspiration, which was silent in nature. And what that means is she was bottle feeding, bottle feeding, suck, swallow, breathe. She aspirated and she just kept on going. Like she didn't stop, no um, indication that she was getting into trouble um, outwardly. And of note, during that study, um, she had some inspiratory strider that worsened as the feeding progressed. So, what happened with her, we did the study, um, and then the next day, I fed her early in the morning went to the residence, like, I don't like what I'm hearing, I 
feel like she's really getting into trouble. So we did a phase like that day. So she had a modified, and the very next day we performed fees. This is what we saw. So here at the upper body, as you can see, these are secretions. They're just kind of sliding into her airway. Her epiglottis is very, um, what we would say, tight, kind of folding up like a taco. Um, so you can barely see her area of epiglottic folds. So I would describe those as tight, short. Um, and that's kind of indicative of Marino Malaysia. There is a gap between her arytenoids here. There's also a posterior gap between her vocal cords. Her cords are moving, but when she swallows, there's still kind of an opening here. And that is likely from the infection. There was a thing of clumber, a little bit of light. <clears throat> and kind of a delayed swallow. When you're seeing green to the level of the piriform sinuses, that indicates that the swallow is a little delayed. This was definitely one we you know, reviewed with our ENT. Um, we did develop a you know, kind of a safety feeding plan with her. Um, we did a lot of education with mom, and after her discharge, we repeated the study as an outpatient. So that is one of um, the very nice things that I think that we're continuing to build. Um, is our, you know, our inpatient population, we can perform the study in-house and we can, you know, repeat it quickly or give them a month or whatever after they're discharged. It really does allow us to do multiple, um, multiple studies, again, without expensing multiple months to radiation. Does anybody want to see that again? <laughs> um, all right, so test your knowledge. Um, according to C. Hirsch et al., approximately how many chest x rays are equivalent to one modified very quality study? Yeah. Okay. Which of the following is an advantage of a fee study? No time limit, no radiation exposure, no barium added to the food or liquid. May be repeated more frequently than a swallow study or all of the above. All right, so um, an infant was born at 38 weeks with moderate HIE. During the physical exam, you notice that the, excuse me, the cry is hoarse and weak, and it appears that the infant is having a hard time managing secretions. So, what's the best instrumental assessment for swallowing for this patient? <laughs> All right, that's our reference list. That is it. So we're happy to take questions. I may have missed this. At what level is the scope going down to? So I think it's obviously getting the white out from the soft palate. Right. So we're passing the flexible scope one side of the nose, so through the nasal mucosa, and we just kind of park it right above 
we don't we don't want to intubate. We don't right. want to we don't want to touch the original. <laughs> we don't want to touch the epiglottis. So, in our neonate population, that space is very 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 small, very small. So, um, we have learned very quickly that the feeder has just as an important job um, of holding and positioning the patient, keeping the patient calm, um, kind of keeping the head in midline. Um, so that, that role is it's, it's very key to getting good images um, for the analysis. Jay, there's something in the chat, but I can't. Um, no, 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 um, I was going to say one is uh, bilateral yeah. left. Can you repeat the question? <clears throat> oh, sorry. So Dr. Chenez is asking, can you mention any contraindications to these? And I was saying a bilateral cleft palate or lip and palate. What we need is the tissue to hold the scope up high. So if there isn't enough tissue to hold the scope into the nose, then the scope will fall and it'll basically be laying on the patient's tongue and that's not going to be comfortable for them. <laughs> So, and anytime you know there's a there's a patient that's just physiologically just not stable, um, they shouldn't be eating in the first place. So we wouldn't jump to fees right away. Oh, that's better. <laughs> so there's a question as an outpatient PCP ordering. Oh, oh where do you go? Ordering. We often get a statement. It was done, and the results are with speech pass, but we don't get the report. Um, just to either way. Um, so typically when we're finished, we like to route the report to the provider. So if you don't get that, then maybe we need to come up with a different method. Um, but our reports live under the consult tab in the notes section. We don't have the video of our studies in Epic, though, because I don't know that our tower is smart enough to move it. Do you, do you want to give our phone number? People can always call. Sure, and you can um, call us in our department if you need it, and that number is 985-9813. Um, Maybe that's a question. I'm a country pediatrician, and I don't know that I want a fees or I want a fees, but I've got a baby I'm looking at. I'm a little concerned. I'm assuming that I can get them, maybe if I want, I can get them into you quickly, so you decide if that's right. How do I do that best? I'm going to make that turnaround time, because most of the time my referrals to you are not urgent. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, so our schedule of Lenora, kind of feels these. So she'll get referrals, especially in infants that are under a year. Okay. Um, so if, if they get a referral for a follow-up study. Maybe look at this faster. Yeah. Um, if, they get, if she gets a referral for a modified barium follow study in infant under a year, she sends it to us. And we kind of screen it to say, yes, let's do a follow study or less, yes, let's do a feed. Um, there's also our baby bridge clinic that we offer. So if you have a patient that's six months or younger, that would need services more quickly. Um, you can refer and just put baby bridge in the referral and that gets those patients in typically within two weeks. We are, um, just to kind of expand on that, um, we are kind of leaning more towards going with seeds first um, in our infant population under 12 months. Um, I think it's been very rare that We've done feed first and needed to do a follow study, but we'd rather do this, the feed study, um, just so that we can spare that little one from, you know, additional radiation exposure. Are there situations where you would, uh, <coughs> the swallow study would be preferable to the feed if you would start with that? You might have a lot of examples. Yeah, and I'm not. I got into the weeds with her chart. <laughs> I'm trying to remember, you know, why we did the swallow study first with her. I don't know if we were questioning reflux. Um, you know, as we talked about in the, at the beginning of the presentation, you know, seeing what's going on inside the esophagus is something that we're not able to see um, 
during a seed study, and that would be a modified that would give us more information with that. So, you know, if it's, if it's something to that nature, um, you're really questioning that this could be uh, reflux related, a modified would be appropriate. And again, like with our you know, palate <clears throat> kiddos, if there's not enough sort of structure to hold the scope, we would go um, Dr. Smith also asked, I imagine that assessing feeding safety in both sports races is a common use of this procedure. Yes, um, we have had quite a few of these patients come through <clears throat> that we've seen with ENT or in the ENT department. Those are, those are the ones we like to coordinate together. Um, and those patients typically get more frequent feed studies because as the parents are like, their cry is so much stronger. Um, do you think we could try a different position? Usually in babies that have vocal cord paresis, we have to do a sideline position um, to kind of help compensate for that vocal cord closure. Um, and when babies get big, that's hard to hold. <laughs> they get wiggly and nosy, and it's hard to maintain that position. So usually that is a patient that is the study is repeated on pretty frequently so that we can try to get them in a more natural position. Um, and also assess to see if they're getting that vocal cord movement back or if we need to manage it in another way. Anyone else? These are great questions. If you think of something later, we're available. We love talking. Is there talking any about limit this. that you find tends to be less successful with the disease just in terms of? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Toddlers. <laughs> Toddlers. Um, sure. But they're hard to do as well as they are. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's, yeah, toddlers like two and three year olds are hard. As Sam mentioned, um, in her portion, you know, we're adding barium. Uh, you know, during a solid study, we're adding barium to their food, and they're like, mm -hmm, you done something. I don't, you know, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to eat it. And sometimes the studies are very limited. Um, but thinking about trying to have a two-year-old be still for the scope to pass is also a big ask. Um, the, little, the little one that we did, the little boy that fell asleep. He was a big kid. I, was he even two yet? But he was a big boy in it. I mean, he was kicking and grabbing and thrashing, and then ultimately he just tired out and fell asleep. He fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> so we didn't accomplish much that day. Other than a workout, trying to get the <laughs> scope to stay in the <laughs> position. Just out of curiosity, on the uh, the scope that you have suction, or you just have to hold your breath if you see it coming backwards? <laughs> we just hold our breath. breath. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's there's no uh, suction um, on the end of the scope. We can t take still shots, but we haven't quite developed our dexterity enough to be able to do that. Um, and again, that's why we really appreciate our bedside nurses being available. Um, so if we do need to suction, she's right there, and we can do it if we need to. At the bedside, we have suction and blow by set up, ready to go. Mm -hmm. Live and learn. <laughs> um, and if we have it set up, then knock on wood, we don't need it. Uh, just to follow, are you guys, uh, with the top patient all goes to Tanglewood, are you guys still going to be over here or you come to Tanglewood just to tell our patients? Or? We'll be in both locations. Okay. So we'll have our office at community and we'll have space at Tanglewood. Anybody else? Thank you guys so much for letting us speak today.